Thank you, Jerry. It's a bit of a bum steer of a Bible reading to get. I'm glad you're a warden. James Taylor, one of our parish councillors, will be doing it tonight. Um, let me add my welcome to Mike's and to Paul's. It's great to be here. I'm Chris. I'm one of the ministers. I want to pray as we prepare to look at God's word. Father, we thank you that you are the God who speaks. You have made yourself known. And you have acted in human history. And we have a record of that. And we do pray that as we consider your word this morning, you would help us to see um, who you are, who the Lord Jesus is, and the great hope that is found in him. Amen. Um, well, over the next three Sundays, we'll be looking at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, uh, the first three chapters, which relate to us the circumstances of and the background to Jesus' birth. And today, if you know your kind of church calendar, uh, we come to our first Sunday in Advent, kind of the period leading up to Christmas that anticipates Jesus' Advent, his arrival. And I think this Christmas, this Christmas, that period of Advent has particular resonance for us, doesn't it? That idea of anticipation, of waiting for something to come, something to happen something to change, a downward trend in COVID cases, an end to self-isolation, double donut days, a vaccine, a lifting of restrictions, meeting in larger numbers, being able to sing in church. And whether we're here in Australia where things, as Tonga uh, said, are kind of returning to some form of normal or whether we live In the Northern Hemisphere, where things are very much not normal at this time of year, Christmas 2020 will be observed by a weary world. It will be observed by a weary world, a world weary of viruses and lockdowns and loss, a world weary of political wrangling and injustice and just endless conflict, it seems. But I do want to suggest that perhaps we shouldn't despair of that that maybe in this moment, at this time, that's a good thing. Because when it comes to our experience of Christmas, that mixture of weariness and anticipation, that that longing for change and for the realisation of promises, that experience that we all have right now, this Christmas, that actually helps us to, to enter into the experience, enter into the world that Jesus entered 2,000 years ago a world of weary Jewish hope, a world where God's people, the Jews, ask themselves, where is God? Is he active? Is he doing anything to bring about his purposes? And the opening chapters of Matthew's gospel speak in a particular way to that weary Jewish world, a world of weary anticipation and frustrated hope, As you may know, Jewish hope, it's centered around the promise of the Messiah. In Greek, the Christ, God's promised king who would come and restore the kingdom of Israel. But by the first century AD, that hadn't happened. God's people were living in their own land, but they were under the rule of others. And that had been the experience of successive generations for hundreds of years, a sort of spiritual and existential lockdown. And so in the face of such weariness of his fellow Jewish people, how does Matthew begin this this good news story? With a genealogy, a family tree. Now to us, family trees might seem like a very boring way to begin a book. I don't know if you're someone who's interested at all in those things. The only time I ever remember putting together my family tree was for a school assignment in year four or five or something. But to the Jewish world in which Matthew belonged, genealogies were a matter of great importance. And in particular, the way that Matthew presents his genealogy, it shows us that he is concerned with proving things about Jesus to his readers. In particular, three things. First, that Jesus is a true Jew. He's a true Jew. Second, that he is the true Messiah. He is the promised king. And third, that he is the true fulfillment, the true fulfillment of all of God's activity, all his saving purposes for his people, for the whole world. 
And you can see that in verse 1, can't you? Matthew outlines that at the very beginning. The historical record, or that could be translated the story of the generations, of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then you may notice in verse 17, he kind of returns there and and mirrors that in his summary. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, from David until the exile to Babylon, 14, and from the exile to Babylon until the Messiah, 14 generations. Jesus, David, Abraham. Abraham, David, Jesus. Matthew's primary purpose in writing his gospel at least at the time that he was inspired to write it, is to show to his fellow Jews that in the person of Jesus, the Christ has come. Maybe not as they expected, but he has come. And that makes all the difference to their weary hopes, spiritual and otherwise. And in in the forward movement of God's saving purposes, Jesus being the Christ of Jewish hope makes all the difference to our weary hopes, spiritual and otherwise. If you are weary this morning of this year of life and wondering, who is God and how can I possibly know him and be refreshed by him? Please look at this genealogy. The thrill of hope is here. The thrill of hope. But as we look at this genealogy, a couple of things we need to probably bear in mind. You'll notice throughout it, it says the word fathered, so-and-so fathered someone, fathered so-and-so. That word is just the word begat, and it does mean biological, father, son, mother, daughter. But it's also used plenty of times just to mean produced or resulted in. It's not necessarily a biological term. And in this genealogy, this is seen in the fact that there are names listed here with people who are referred to as the father of. But in the rest of the Old Testament, that's not actually their father, not biologically. Does this mean that Matthew did not know his Old Testament and he got it wrong? No. It means that this genealogy, though it includes Jesus' physical ancestry, is primarily intended to be that of his legal ancestry, his claim to the family throne. It's important to remember, particularly when we come to Joseph and to Mary. That's one thing. And the other thing you may have noticed, uh, which uh, Matthew mentions in verse 17, is the three lots of 14 generations. Is this a happy historical coincidence that it just happens to fall this way? Well, no. This is a selective list. There are names missing from here. In one particular period, 600 years is covered. Why is this so? What is Matthew doing here? What is he telling us? Well, the Ultimate answer is we, we don't know. There are several theories about the numbering, and I won't go into them here because the ultimate answer is we're not really sure. But it does tell us that this list has been constructed with a purpose, highlighted names. It's a symbolic number, and it means that Matthew has several points he wants to communicate. So why don't we look at the points that he highlights in the structure of this genealogy? And the first thing is that Jesus is. He's a son of Abraham, Matthew wants to communicate. He's a true Jew. Verse 2, Abraham fathered Isaac. Now to Matthew's Jewish readers, this is a very important starting point because it was Abraham, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 12, to whom God revealed himself personally and made very specific and remarkable promises that from Abraham would come a whole nation numbering greater than the stars in the sky. And so the mention here of Abraham and then of Isaac and of Jacob and and Judah and his brothers, it shows Jesus' connection to to the founding fathers of Israel. He is a true Jew, Matthew says. But even to us, Matthew's non Jewish readers, though it's not as obvious, this is an equally significant starting point. Because as God also promises in Genesis 12, it is through this Jewish nation that God will ultimately bless the whole world. And in the New Testament, in many places, but one place in particular, in the letter of the Apostle Paul to the church in Galatia, in Galatians chapter 3, Paul writes that all who have faith in Jesus are children of Abraham. 
And so if you call Jesus Lord today, if you bow down to him as Christ, as Saviour, as King, and God's promises to Abraham, his promise to know the true and living God and to be able to live as one of his people with all the hope now and into the future that that holds, that applies to you. That applies to you. And it starts with Jesus being a true Jew. But he's not just a true Jew. He's also a son of David, and that makes him the true Messiah, Matthew says. In verse 6 we read, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered King David. And I really do think that the King David and the whole stuff around him, this is the main focus of Matthew's genealogy, that Jesus inherits David's kingship. And because of the family connection with David, it needs to be established as legitimate. You may notice that that whole second and third section is devoted entirely to tracing the royal line. So verse 6, Then David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife, Solomon fathered Rehoboam, Rehoboam fathered Abijah, Abijah fathered Asa, and so on. And this second section, it climaxes in verse 11. And Josiah fathered Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. The exile to Babylon. Even as a first century Jew, the exile would have just loomed so large. That time when the Babylonian Empire came in took over Israel, deported most of its population back to Babylon, an empire that was subsequently conquered by other empires, Greek and now Roman. The exile was essentially the end of David's line, at least as far as meaningful rule is concerned. And to the, you know, to the discerning reader, this naturally produces a tension point. What does it mean for the rule of David's family to continue if they're no longer ruling. Because the line itself continues, doesn't it? Matthew picks that up in verse 12. Then after the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah fathered Shealtiel, Shealtiel fathered Zerubbabel, and so on. But the mere mention of David's line continuing, that doesn't resolve this tension. Because God's promise to David was not just that his family line would continue, but that they would continue to sit on the throne that they will continue to rule. Not only is that not the case throughout the time of the exile and after it, by the time the first century AD approaches, that's not even looking likely at all. The only hope, the only hope is if the promised Messiah comes with power to upend the whole thing, to change everything. And of course, that's where Matthew's heading isn't it? Eventually, he brings the family tree up to the present in verse 16. And Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, the Christmas man. It's interesting to note how Matthew refers to Joseph, isn't it? Unlike all his predecessors, he's denied something. All his predecessors in the list, they fathered someone, but Joseph is denied that action. His connection with Jesus is only by his marriage to Mary. Now, this doesn't invalidate his family parentage of Jesus in the legal sense, but it is irregular. And this irregularity, it's jarring to the reader who's been following this all the way through. And I think it's intentionally jarring. Matthew wants his reader to to question what he means by this sudden change-up. He'll go on to answer that question in the next passage, in the subsequent birth narrative that begins in verse 18. But at this point, it adds a wonderful uniqueness to Jesus' arrival, all the while placing him firmly within the holy kosher line of Abraham and David. And so to the first century Jewish reader, living under Roman rule, reading his or her Old Testament, perhaps hearing about this Jesus called Christ, but doubtful of his kingly credentials, Matthew says, don't doubt. His lineage is good. He's a true Jew, and his claim to the throne is rightful. 
Your hope for a king is no longer realized. Your hope for a king looks vastly different than what you expected. He's not a human ruler simply. He's not a military ruler. He's greater than all of those. Of course, that was the hardest thing to grasp of God's own people, and it continues to be today for all of us. Of course, that's the significance of Jesus' earthly lineage and what it tells us about his identity. He is a true Jew and a true descendant of David. But his identity is not defined solely by that. For one, it's also defined by his divine lineage. As Matthew will go on to recount in the next passage, Jesus is uniquely Emmanuel, which means God with us. He is the eternal God in the flesh. Only God himself can truly save his people. But Jesus' identity is also defined by what he does by the fact that what he came to do brought to fulfillment or to completion God's saving purposes for his people and for the world. Jesus is the true fulfillment of God's saving purposes. And Matthew will go on in the rest of his gospel to unpack this in a lot more detail, but he hints at it here in the genealogy. He hints at it by saying that Jesus fulfills God's vision for kingship. See, Jesus is the king that David and his descendants could never be, the true king after God's own heart. Maybe one of the reasons you don't like going into your family tree is because you've heard that there are some skeletons back there. A few of us were talking about it earlier in the week, and one staff member, I won't say who, said, you know what, in my family tree, there's an axe murderer about three or four generations back. And we were reminded that, yeah, there are things that we don't like about our family tree. And this genealogical list includes some very questionable monarchs. Manasseh, Ahaz, Jeconiah, godless men who led their people away from God, ultimately into captivity, spiritual ruin, material ruin. Even the decent ones, Hezekiah, Josiah, David himself, they've all got their own blemished records. In fact, Matthew includes in verse 6, if you may have noticed, a not too, a none too subtle reference to David's most notorious sin. He's taking advantage of Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. He highlights that, Uriah's wife, with whom he committed adultery, whose husband he subsequently had killed. David was a broken man. This list highlights, well, it highlights God's grace that he would use broken people and still work his purposes out through them. But it also highlights the great need for God's people to have as their king, not just a fellow sinful man, but God himself, as God always intended. And of course, that is who Jesus is. As God in the flesh, he alone was able to live a perfectly sinless life and be the model and leader God's people always needed. Jesus fulfills God's vision for kingship. He also fulfills God's justice and mercy. Matthew hints at that too here. You know, the justice of God and the mercy of God that is revealed in Israel's history and the experience of being taken into exile and then being brought out of exile, well, that, that's revealed in its fullness at the cross. At the cross of Jesus, where Jesus as the Christ took on God's judgment for human sin and human rebellion. Jesus was, he was exiled from God in our place, once and for all time, for all people everywhere, not just the Jewish people. And he was raised from that exile to show that God mercifully offers us new life with him now, with him forever. So Jesus is the source of God's blessing. He's the, he's the guarantor of it. He has achieved and he offers us restored relationship with God. Now, he offers us the hope of life eternal with God and his restored kingdom to come. Matthew hints at that in his genealogy. Don't let it slip you by. If you are yet to come to that point with Jesus, consider the grace that that Matthew is sowing the seeds of here. 
and then read the rest of Matthew's Gospel and see how that grace is so fully revealed in Jesus. And lastly, Jesus fulfills God's blessing to the nations or to the whole world. Matthew hints at God's non-Jewish intentions, even as he relates Jesus' very Jewish genealogy. I think we see this most explicitly in four of the five women who are named in this genealogy. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Uriah's wife. I mean, the very fact that women are given places in a patriarchal genealogy is striking. What's also striking is that each of these women were likely non-Jews. And yet each played a part in God's people. Each were used by God to, to further his purposes. And we don't have time to go into the detail of each woman's story, but suffice it to say that, that though they each experienced significant hardship, in some cases abuse of power and human selfishness that's worst, they each were brought into the fellowship of God's people. And they experienced the blessing of life with the one true God. And lastly, on that point, consider the the bookend, the bookends of Matthew's gospel. Here we are at the opening of it, the genealogy. The Christ has come of the Jews for the Jews. But Matthew chapter 28, right at the end, referred to as Jesus' great commission to his disciples. What is that commission? Go and make disciples of every nation. Christ has come from the Jews to all people. That means us. Matthew hints at that in his genealogy. So even something as seemingly dry and uninteresting as a family tree, we're shown that there there is hope for a weary world. Because it's not just any genealogy. Years ago, I was in the city, and I uh, I walked past a building site, and a relatively modest six-story building had been demolished, and another was being built in its place. And I remember looking through the boards, you know, that separated the hole from the footpath, looking down into the hole. It was a deep hole. I had to guess it was already five or six stories deep. I could barely see the bottom from my angle. What did that tell me? Told me that a very large building was being built in its place, since a very deep foundation was being dug. The bigger the building, the bigger the foundation needs to be. What does Matthew's genealogy tell us? It tells us that he is building a big building. Who Jesus is, that's what the rest of his gospel will go on to reveal and, and, and unpack. And so he's going to go deep with his foundation. That's what this genealogy is about. These are Jesus' roots, his Jewish roots, his kingly Messiah roots, his God roots. And as you come to this Christmas, with its thrill of hope perhaps tinged by weariness and ongoing worry and disrupted well-being, I encourage you, reflect on Matthew's genealogy. Let it remind you that God is the God who is at work in human history. He's in control. He works out his purposes. Even if we can't see them at the time, even if they are difficult for us to experience at the time, and through his grace, he chooses to do so using human beings. Incredible. He redeems the mess of human relationships. That's something we should take from this. That if we are God's people by trust in Jesus, whatever mess our lives may be in now or have been in the past, God is in the business of redeeming that. He uses the mess of human relationships and brokenness to bring about blessing for his own people. And if they would accept it for the whole weary world. May that be true of us, each of us here. This Christmas into 2021 for the rest of our lives. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your inspiring of Matthew to record your activity in the world. 
to show us who Jesus is. We pray that for each of us here, as we wrestle with weariness and our own regrets, that you may turn our eyes to Jesus, who has done it all for us, who is the one true King. May we rejoice in that, that we can live for you now by trusting him and know that we can live for you forever. The weary world rejoices.